number 10 is getting lit. Whether their decisions were in regards to themselves, their offspring, their futures, their laws, or their people, pharaohs weren't always known for making the most rational or sane choices. But some things they felt were completely in the hands of gods, and that wasn't their want, but rather something the divine wished and passed through them. Something that falls into that category of the pharaonic law against offense or disrespect to the sun god. It was considered one of the most awful crimes you could commit, and that's pretty difficult because Egypt didn't really have much crime thanks to their efficient baboon police force. If you vandalized or robbed a temple, committed any form of personal disrespect, or were otherwise found guilty of any offense related to the sun god, you were usually sentenced to be burned alive, usually accompanied by a ritual that sacrificed the individual to the god. While the ancient Egyptians rarely practiced actual human sacrifices, this was one of the few exceptions. While burning alive is painful enough to begin with, it was considered the most horrific death of all by ancient Egyptians because of that ritual significance. They believed strongly in preserving the physical body for life after death and believed that destroying the person's physical body completely by burning would leave them with no vessel in the afterlife, left to drift listlessly. While the gods could still technically intervene to help this person should they feel they deserve it, it was about as terrifying as a punishment as a believer in ancient Egyptian society could imagine. Disturbing decision number nine is boys in the breeze. Sesotris gets to be remembered for two things. He was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, and he put up giant hoo-hahs and wee-wees everywhere he went. Thankfully, these two feats of his went hand in hand as he would send warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretch the kingdom further than anyone else ever had. After each battle, he would commemorate his success by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's bits on it. You can literally trace a map of this dude's conquest via dongs on paper. Herodotus saw some of Sesotris's monuments firsthand. For the most part, these pubic pillars were engraved with the usual self-glory crap. Who he was, how he had subdued his enemies, and how certain he was that the gods were in his favor of his invade everyone policy. But guys, that's not all. The type of pubic pillar you received, male versus female, was a battle review system. Forget Google reviews and TripAdvisor ratings. Leaving a ladies versus man's pubic pillar would define if the opposing army had fought valiantly or like a bunch of sissies. 1500 years after they're erected, they still stood in Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Disturbing decision number eight is the Ram Blood Bevy. Pasatik III was the last pharaoh of the 26th dynasty, having a pitiful six month run before a full scale Persian invasion rolled into town led by King Cambyses II. A few days after his coronation, rain fell at Thebes, which was a rare event that frightened some Egyptians, who interpreted this as a bad omen and were already dubious of the young, inexperienced king. They were right to be. Sadly, was easily defeated at the Battle of Pasilium due to how little time he'd been on the throne and how unprepared Egypt was for this invasion. That, and he was betrayed by one of his allies. So, he fled to Memphis with his army, who'd lost all hope in their pharaoh, and watch as he is captured. His stupid ass is carried back to Egypt in chains when he should have just stayed on the throne and accepted his fate in the first place. Herodotus writes how all his daughters and wives were taken captives, his wife slain, his nobleman sentenced to death. Cambius brought all of them before the deposed pharaoh to try and elicit a reaction, a weakness. But only when the pharaoh is shown an old friend of his turned into a homeless beggar does he actually become upset and break. The unusual compassion actually spared the pharaoh death, who Cambius has kept in his court for consultation. You You'd think he'd appreciate that, since that literally never happens in history. But Pasantik tries to raise a rebellion and it fails miserably. With a death sentence imminent, the former pharaoh decides to take his life, not by any traditional, normal, painless method. No, 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 no. This guy chugs down a vat of ram's blood, a literal vat, then promptly died. Disturbing decision number seven is excessive children. If you know anything about anyone in Egypt, you already know this is about Ramesses' ancient ass. And I say that not because he lived in ancient times, but because this is the king who somehow lived to 96 in ancient Egypt and still only died because someone ripped a hole in his jugular like they're opening a bag of Doritos. Ramesses enjoyed his time alive, right up until the very end. He built more statues and monuments than any other king of Egypt, and he slept with more women than anyone too. Maybe more than any human being ever. Someone has to have that title out there. If I had to guess based on who exists in documented history, he's taking the cake. 
Pun intended. The dude had a bare minimum of 100 guaranteed children. Guaranteed. If he has that many confirmed, there was definitely a lot more unconfirmed. Gets crazier when I mention he had some of these children with his own children. This was ancient Egypt after all. Gotta keep that royal bloodline pure by making their blood thick as mud, you know? He married at least three of his own kids, including his firstborn. He may or may not have married four. Historians aren't sure whether his wife Hotemeyer was his daughter or his sister, but since this is Ramesses that we're talking about, there's no reason that daughter, sister, and wife have to be mutually exclusive. Ramses had over 200 wives in his lifetime and pretty much outlived all of them. Disturbing decision number six is bring the squad, another law made to serve Egyptian pharaoh's own interests while simultaneously screwing over everyone in the general vicinity, and believe me, there was a few of those, was a law surrounding these servant contracts. See, royals and nobilities in the old kingdom had super fun clause written into their hieroglyphic employee contracts in the fine print, stating that when they drop dead, the whole staff is coming with them, dead or alive, take your pick. A dead king needed his squad to support him in the afterlife. On the practical side, you couldn't leave any anyone behind who might cause trouble for the new king. It made for a mass display of power as these weren't just lowly servants being tossed down there. When the practice started, it was people of incredibly high rank and tremendous value to Egyptian state. This went to instill the lower class with tremendous awe and respect for these early kings. What better way to show off your power than to throw away your wealth? What's more valuable than your whole family? In a recent vid, the top 10 repulsive queens from ancient Egypt you never learned about, I mentioned how Lady Pharaoh Mernis is buried with 50 of her servants. All of them were alive when interred. Almost 600 victims are found buried with King Dejer, and King Ahab had 41 courtiers, retainers, and others who downed poison and were buried with him. Egyptian royalty stopped this practice in the early First Dynasty, but it continued in a more innocent form. Yushabati, the little carved figurines that can magically serve the deceased in the afterlife. Number 5. The Plow Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. Enter the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything, and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars, and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is, after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly it's the, it's the fifth of, uh, well I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. H hieroglyphs are hard, man. I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No, but they did have to tell time. And as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky the sun, assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. Oh, 
Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. 
Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us were stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archaeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind-blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, the lost labyrinth. Archaeologists uncovered what's believed to be the remains of a long lost labyrinth below the sand of the Pyramid of Hawara, known as, quote, the labyrinth. Built by Amenhet III, it was the most visited sites of the ancient world. Greek Herodotus claimed to have counted 3,000 rooms in the pyramid's funeral complex during the 5th century BC. According to them, the underground temple consists of over 3,000 rooms filled with remarkable hieroglyphics and paintings. Close, too, located less than 100 kilometers from Cairo. In 2008, with the aid of ground penetrating technology, a Belgian Egyptian expedition was able to confirm the presence of an enormous underground temple. With no visible remains, the story was thought to be a legend passed down until Egyptologists uncovered its foundations in the 1800s. The results of this expedition indicate the presence of grid-like structures deep beneath the sand. Please tell me there's no minotaur just running around down there. Okay. Number four, the mystery queen. Archaeologists have unearthed a tomb of a previously unknown queen believed to have been the wife of Pharaoh Neferefra, who ruled 4,500 years ago. The tomb was discovered in Abu Sur, an old kingdom necropolis southwest of Cairo, where there are several pyramids dedicated to the pharaohs of the fifth dynasty. The name of his wife had not been known until recently. She was Kenta Kaz, renowned as the mother of two Egyptian pharaohs. Kenta Kaz I is a mysterious woman who ruled in the fourth dynasty dynasty and has archaeologists puzzled at her burial complex in Giza. Though rough evidence for ancient Egyptian queens, the remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within the necropolis until its excavation in the late 1930s. Hieroglyphic inscriptions concerning her title had been discovered and subsequently became open for interpretation. Her title was initially regarded to be, quote, King of Upper and Lower Egypt and, quote, Mother of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. So who was this mysterious, powerful figure in ancient Egypt? Who was she? Number three, the Dendera Lights. All these tombs and underground chambers, how the hell did they see anything under there? Well, we really don't know, but we have some sort of direction. These ancient battery looking light bulbish things could have maybe been the power source. Ancient Egypt seems to be full of keyholes, drill holes, and shafts that are literally impossible without high powered tools. Most people say aliens, me included, but I also say, the Dendera light bulbs. They've been theorized as being some sort of battery. The Hothor Temple at Dendera contains several relief depictions, Harsimtus in the form of a snake, emerging from a lotus flower. The Dendera light is a variation of this mode of showing Harsimtus in an oval container, a snake inside, taking a number of humans to lift, and it holds apparent meanings of the start of creation. Look, I don't care what you say, this thing is a light bulb. It's got a filament. And coils? Come on, drill holes? They couldn't have just lit fires underground, the smoke, the heat, I don't think so. Now a couple of DeWalts, just sanding up the pyramids real nice, you know? Who knows? Who knows? Number two, the city of Punt. The land of Punt or the ancient city of Punt was an ancient kingdom sometime back then. A trading partner of ancient Egypt, it was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, precious stones, black wood, ivory, you name it. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions. At time, Punt is referred to as the land of God. No pressure, archeologists. The exact location of Punt is debated and unknown by historians. Cue Indiana Jones movie. Various locations have been offered southeast of Egypt, a Red Sea coastal region, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, no one really knows. First deciphered in Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822, scholars began reading Egyptian texts and the mystery got mystery. -er. 
That's not a word. More questions arose as to where Punt was located and what happened to it. The land of Punt is written by voyagers as being praised for its lavish riches and goodness of land. Okay, so it exists somewhere. This is awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it suck if we already found everything? We're going on an expedition, boy. Grab your thing, let's go. And coming in at the number one spot, the Sphinx. Where do I even start? Known as the oldest carved rock like ever, its age is debated literally every day due to the questions it asks scholars. Was it wind erosion, water erosion? How many times was this thing broken and rebuilt? The great Sphinx of Giza, the limestone statue of a reclining Sphinx, a mythical creature with a head of a human and the body of a lion. Facing directly west to east, it stands on the Giza Plateau on the west bank of the Nile. The face of the Sphinx appears to represent the Pharaoh Khafra, although this is heavily debated as wrong gears and looking nothing like him. It's since been restored with tons of layers of limestone blocks, although still unfixed. Its nose was broken off for unknown reasons between the 3rd and 10th century. Maybe some artillery fire over the years? Who knows? The Sphinx is the oldest known sculpture in Egypt, and archaeologists suggest that it was created in the Old Kingdom using unknown construction methods. Yeah, definitely that battery thing. From 1817 to 1930, this thing was buried up to its neck and written and drawn about for centuries. I wonder what other secrets lay under her right now. I guess we'll eventually find out someday. Number 10 is the Pet Patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and and miraculously evades capture. Well, in real ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Definitely nothing like Babu in Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is no modern phenomena. Number 9 is Tatted Up Tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now, Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a that's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why it was only women, what they meant, or what they symbolized beyond the vague generalization I just gave you. Tattooed mummies dating back to the 11th century dynasty have been found by archaeologists, some with religious symbolism, other with dots and swirls located on the lower chest, the abdominal, and the thighs. Some mummies were believed to have been tattooed with medical symbols, potentially to treat ailments. Although the meaning of ancient Egyptian tattoos may be unclear, it seems evident that they had an array of implications and that women of many different social classes chose to wear the baddies. Speaking of things we can't understand, number eight in our countdown is my favorite pun yet. I put that shit on everything. Except quite literally. Egyptian doctors used human and animal excrement as a cure-all remedy for diseases and injuries. According to Eber's papyrus recording in 1500 BC, animal feces such as donkey, dog, gazelle, and fly were all celebrated for their healing properties and considered to ward off bad spirits. While we know that Egyptian medicine was incredibly advanced, even having doctors who were specialists, you can't help but question this logic. However, like with most things the Egyptians did, technically they weren't wrong. Research shows that microflora found in some types of animal dung contain antibiotic substances. So sure, you risk some tetanus, but you could also be cured. Lizard blood, dead mice, mud, moldy bread were also all used as topical ointments and dressings, and women were also sometimes dosed with horse saliva as a cure for low libido. And speaking of a woman's libido, man, did the Egyptians have some crazy women's healthcare going on. Number seven, we'll call the fertility games. I have a new family appreciation for modern medicine after learning a way our ancient Egyptian friends tested fertility was by placing a garlic or onion clove inside of a woman's. This is because ancient Egyptians believed that all orifices of a woman were connected, kind of like subway tunnels. Anyways, if the doctor could smell garlic on your breath the next morning, then the tubes were clear and the woman was fertile. But if the doctor couldn't smell garlic, then the tubes were blocked and it was assumed that the woman couldn't give birth. Once you are pregnant though, you can find out the sex of your baby 
in another bizarre tradition, popping a squat over some barley. Why? Because if it barely grew, then the baby was a boy. If the barley grew like crazy, then the baby was a girl. This test was believed to be highly accurate, and they weren't wrong in that. Turns out the test was actually accurate in 70% of all cases. And in 1963 lab testing, the urine of a pregnant woman did cause the seeds to sprout. Since she was in fact pregnant with a girl, it's likely the seeds started to grow faster due to elevated levels of estrogen, which stimulates growth. I can think of some truly hilarious ways to integrate this into a gender reveal party. But kids aren't for everyone, and that's okay. Ancient Egyptians were notoriously not fans of them, so let's talk number six, safe sex. There are actually lots of stories of Egyptian contraceptive methods, but don't get too fascinated because these aren't anything you want to try and recreate. Egyptian women would collect the dung of crocodiles or elephants to mix with sacred herbs and honey. They would then apply this paste mixture to their vulva and up inside the vagina as a protective seal on their genitals. Okay, men, don't think you're getting much better though as your contraceptive was to rub onion juice all over your junk. If neither of these worked, which shocker if they didn't, the Egyptians had an herb called silphium, which was used to help devoid a woman of an unwanted pregnancy. They even knew what has been confirmed today that a chia gum from an achia tree worked as a spermicide and would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy after the fact. While it's impressive they figured out what they did, this whole section just has yeast infection written all over it, so let's just keep going for everybody's sake. Number five, fake beard. I need one of these because, uh, yeah, I tried recently and it disappeared off the channel. I was too, I was too ashamed to come back. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. This is pretty impressive. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male, as a male pharaoh. So the pharaoh fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was done as an act of politics. Now after her passing come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name. He, yeah, just scripted, back then it wasn't you know hard to just you break one thing and then everything's gone well mostly everything now we have this idiot being like hey fake beards look at that you missed one number four game night i love board games even monopoly believe it or not i have the patience for it every now and then but ancient egyptians they also fancied a board game turns out who knew dogs and jackals mahen senate and 20 squares these were all popular go-to games for their ancient egyptian cottage weekends mahen was played around 2500 bc and the goal was to reach the center of the spiral first the board was a coiled snake almost it was quite beautiful senate was the most popular game queens and kings alike would play this one senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now, of course, the rules are still unknown and heavily debated, just like Monopoly. But you had three rows of 10 squares. The last five squares are decorated, so it's assumed that this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these game boards. There's something very Jumanji about this that I want to know more of, but I also don't want to know more of. Why was he buried with a board game? That's kind of terrifying. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing a board game of sorts. Yeah, it kind of looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms would be so sweaty. I'd be like, checkmate, please don't exile me. Thanks so much. Let's play again sometime. Peace. Number three. The first peace treaty. Bizarre at the time? Absolutely, definitely, this is a first. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. Now at this point in time, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire, they were fighting over modern day Syria. Now this conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. At this point, there's tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight, so what's left to do at this point? A peace treaty, right? Hopefully, ideally, Ramses II and King Hattasuli III both negotiated Negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to now get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found in New York right above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. Pretty impressive. I have a license plate above my room, so that's almost as cool, I guess. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty, so that's how you know it's official. Guinness confirms it. Moving on. Number two, renewed passport. Now I'm thinking about where my passport is and I'm immediately panicking. I'm like, oh, which shelf? Ooh. Before a big bad haunting number one, we'll do a fun one with some recent history. This is cheeky. Passports are important and they're a pain to replace. But did you know that you can still get one even if you've been dead for thousands of years? Well, now you do. You just have to be a pharaoh though. That's the only rule. You have to be a pharaoh or some sort of king. Pharaoh Ramses II, we just talked about him, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers. He got a passport back in 1974. Insane, the same time my grandma did probably. After being 
exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided that it's now time to send this lost king off to Paris to get touched up. Now, obviously you're not gonna list this Pharaoh king as luggage, that would be super disrespectful. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute with a photo. Just in case you didn't know. On the passport, he had his info. It's all great. He has age, very old, occupation, a king. And in case it wasn't obvious, it was stated that the king was deceased. Looking at him, you're like, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, go on in. Definitely dead. For sure dead. Don't even have to look twice. We're good. And finally, number one, trusty servant. In ancient Egypt, it was common for servants to accompany their masters into the afterlife. Whenever they go, now you have to go. Horrible, right? This practice reflected the belief that individuals needed assistance and companionship even in the realm of the dead. Hashtag needy. Servants were considered essential for ensuring the comfort and well-being of the deceased here and again in the afterlife, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but again, long time ago, different beliefs. They would be depicted in tomb paintings and inscriptions, and their statues or figurines would be placed in these tombs to then serve the deceased. These servants were believed to continue their duties in the afterlife, providing sustenance, performing daily tasks, and maintaining the deceased social status. Like, when does it end, guy? Like, fuck. Come on. The inclusion of servants and burial rituals exemplifies the importance of social hierarchy and the idea of continuity in ancient Egyptian culture. So while it's crazy to us, it's, well, it's very important then. And it's quite important now. Fucking crazy, but it's still pretty important. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. <laughs> nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second-degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you gonna use to write on it? Ink, you're gonna use ink, obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron-based compounds as well as blue, green, white, and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number six, the haircut. 
A little off the top, Ramsey. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue-eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. Eh, it kind of did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men. We just look better with them. We look, we look good. It's a good look. They were good and then they were great and then they were absolute trash. The Amenhotep. All right, so on the top of the bucket, we got Amen One. He's the great great granddaddy. He effectively extended Egypt's boundaries into Nubia. Next is great granddaddy Amen the Second, who was an army leader with famous archery and battle skills. Supposedly, he was able to shoot arrows straight through a thick of copper plates. His athletic ability was incredible and he was known to have rowed a ship faster than 200 of Egypt's strongest navy men. Next is great Granddaddy Amen III, who built himself endless monuments and temples. Perhaps his most famous construction was the Temple of Luxor in Thebes. This temple has become one of the grandest and most famous temples in Egypt. His diplomatic relations allowed art and culture to flourish, and his building projects are legendary. And then there's disastrous daddy Akhenaten, or Amen IV. This nutcase was obsessed with the sun god Atum and changed his name, appearance, politics, lifestyle, anything he could to feel closer to his lord. This pharaoh was so hated that Egyptians themselves wiped his name from their history. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Armania and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean the horizon of Aten and then ordered a new capital city be built there, moving an estimated 20,000 people over to make it. When he enforced monotheism, Og failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the nation's socio-economic cultural hubs, who was the god priest that oversaw all of their industries. So without them, those pillars of the communities were just gone. And stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest reception. And then we've got the bottom of the bucket. We have our boy Tukmahad, aka King Tut, who by his third year changed his name to Tukmahad and issued decree restoring temples, images, personnel, and privileges of the old gods to undo what his dad had done. He also began the protracted process of restoring the sacred shrines of Amun, which had been severely damaged during his father's rule. No prescription or persecution of Atan, though, Akmahan's god, was undertaken, and royal vineyards and regiments of the army were still named after a ton. Tukmahad unexpectedly died in his 19th year. Whatever the case, he died without designating an heir. This is another four-part family tree. First, great-granddaddy Snerfu founds the fourth dynasty and marries the daughter of the last pharaoh of the third empire, thus helped to solidify his possession as the pharaoh of the new dynasty, as well as secure Khufu's place in the line of succession. Meanwhile, his son, who becomes granddaddy Khufu, pops out the great pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world. Apparently we were so impressed by this that we forgot to write anything else about him or why he did this because we know very little about Khufu. We know he reigned 23 years between 2500 and 2566 and we know he married his sister. Shocker. Khufu traded for highly rare items, prizing both construction materials and precious materials like copper and turquoise and so he developed the mining industry in Egypt. Limestone and granite were also quarried in vast amounts for rather large building projects that he he was working on. Built over a period of 27 years, the Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Khufu's greatest legacy. Khufu's children include nine sons and six daughters, including Defreya and Khafri, who would both become pharaohs following his death. When in power, his son Defreya moved eight kilometers north of Giza and established a new necropolis on a higher leveled ground. Defreya's pyramid was quarried for its stone, and as such, there's very little of it left standing today. Meanwhile, the underson Khafri succeeded the short lived Radifi and married his sister. And and two other queens who were probably his sisters. Best known for his pyramid, one of the three great pyramids of Giza, and also best known for the Sphinx, which bears his likeness on its face. And who else but the Ramses clan? The Ramses the first gets the throne in a super uneventful way. He was friends and confidant to the former pharaoh who didn't have a single heir. Then Ramses spent all of his free time marrying all four of his daughters. Meanwhile, his son, Seti the first, led a great army of 60,000 men and fought in many battles north of Palestine and Syria. King Ramesses II, son of Seti I, was able to finish his father's
father's work by beating the Hittite army in battle of Kadesh and creating the first documented peace treaty in history. Ramses II went on to declare himself a god and rule Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is insane in an era where life expectancy was 30. But before getting to that ripe old age, Ramses spent any free time he had chasing anything with two feet and a heartbeat, enough to sire 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his own sons, leaving no heir. They're back again, the Ptolemies! People loved learning about this batch of literal bastards in the recent top 10 powerful families in history you didn't want to mess with video. Apparently y'all like when I'm doing tongue twisters. For those who don't know why this family could be a tongue twister, an important note is that they always recycled the family names, men always named Platonomy, and women always named Cleopatra or Berenice. They also happen to really, really, really take the old Egyptian ideology of royals only being with other royals a little too seriously. What's created is a massive family tree, one full of manipulation contempt, scandal, and brash killings. While the Platonomies started off strong, building the Library of Alexandria, compiled a star catalog and the earliest surviving table of trigonomic function, and establishing mathematically that an object is and its mirror image must make an equal angles to be a mirror. After the fourth, however, the family became like the Kardashians, talentless and messy. They took up everybody's time, but nobody stopped the free entertainment. So like last time, let me limber up and I'll run us through some of the notorious BS. Platonomy killed his mother who had killed her husband who was having a love affair with her mother and then married his sister Aronso III who was then later killed after Platonomy IV died. Platonomy XII annoyed his children so much, particularly his daughter Berenice IV, that they rebelled against him and drove him from Egypt. Berenice IV ruled briefly. She probably had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled who wasn't a family member. She was beheaded on the orders of her father. Platonomy XII. Platonomy 14 was the younger brother of Cleopatra 7, that's the Mark Antony one, and possibly poisoned by that same sister. Platonomy 7 was then killed by his uncle, the next Platonomy 8, at a wedding feast, or he may have been killed by his own father, Platonomy 4. Scholars disagree. It's so messy, my mouth's so dry. Let's go on to the next one. Our favorite bearded lady was part of this family. It's the Thutmose line. Granddaddy Thutmos the first became king after Amenhotep died without an heir. Probably one of the previous monarchs generals, he came to the throne around age 40 and is thought to have ruled for little over 10 years. Historians have generally described Thomas II as a frail and ineffectual, just the sort of person that a purposely shrewish Hapshaput could push around. Public monuments, however, depict a dutiful Hapshaput standing appropriately next to her husband. Wife to Tut II, Hapshaput failed in the more important duty of producing a son. So when Thut II died young in 1497, yet again, the throne went to a harem child. Duly named Thutmose III, this child was destined to become one of the great warrior kings of Egypt, but at the time of his father's death, he was too young to take the rule. As widow, Hat became regent leader until Thut came of age. Within a few years, however, she proclaimed herself pharaoh, a vile upsurge. And the seven years past that point, she'd taken up cross-dressing imagery. Once depicted as slim and graceful queen, is now full-blown, flail and crook-wielding king with the broad, bare chest of a man and the ferric false beard, but also still long, flowing hair and feminine features. Upon Hat's death in 1458, her stepson, then likely in his early 20s, finally ascended to the throne. Thutmose III was a skilled warrior who brought Egypt's empire to the zenith of its power by conquering all of Syria and crossing the Euphrates. The spoils from his many wars made Thutmose III the richest man in the world. His military accomplishments are recorded on the numerous monuments he built himself. Uh Number 10. Construction. We can't talk about ancient Egypt and the mysteries still unsolved there if we don't start on how the hell these things were built. And also, it's not just like three pyramids. There's 118 of these things. When did they have time to construct all of these? Ropes? Pulley systems? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Ramps? Ramps. Ramps would have been a mile long against the pyramid's height. That's like hundreds of years right there. You ever dug a hole in your backyard? Two feet. It's like six hours right there. And a sore back. Some have theorized a water hydraulic system was used to transport the carved rocks up slopes and tubes with tidal power. Okay, better, better. But like, how did they line up the rocks so perfectly and so square at the top. One inch off and every carpenter knows that's gonna shift everything. Also, the alignment to true north, the odd coincidences with the dimensions resembling the cosmos, they couldn't have known back then, you know? 
Buckle up, it's only gonna get weirder. Number nine, Chamber of Secrets. In 2017, scientists were able to peek inside the Great Pyramid finally using modern day physics. Particles, actually. What they found revealed numerous hidden secret chambers and rooms that were thought to never exist. The most bizarre discoveries was a massive unknown void nearly 100 feet long that lays just above the pyramid's grand gallery. Khufu, also known as the Great Pyramid, was received the most attention due to its size and age, but it wasn't the only chamber they found. No. Gold, mummies, manuscripts, ancient technology. What lies inside these voids? Also, how the hell did they floor and roof a room that's unaccessible? How do you build that inside such a small chamber already? Muon tomography uses cosmic rays of muons and generates a 3D image through nearly any material. This technology is groundbreaking. Literally. Uh, here we go. Yep, found it. There it is. Number eight, the Saqqara Temple. The Pyramid of Djoser, also known as the Step Pyramid, is an archeological site in the Saqqara necropolis. The discovery of a 4,400 year old tomb now seen as UNESCO's World Heritage Site is the six tier, four sided structure, which very well may be the earliest colossal stone structure in Egypt and possibly the world. Stone mounds were made in Europe for millennia, but it was the pyramid shape that started here. It was built 27th century BC during the third dynasty for the Pharaoh Djoser. The pyramid is the center of a huge complex and an enormous courtyard surrounded by ceremonial structures and decorations. Its architect was created from the Egyptian architect himself, Imhotep, the high priest of the god Ra. This guy was like the building manager, you know? The head architect. In fact, wasn't even found or really even studied till about the 1920s and was recently excavated in 2018. The pyramid went through several revisions over the years and in March 2020, the pyramid was officially reopened for visitors after a 14 year fix up. Check out Netflix, they do a great documentary on this. Number seven, Queen Nefertiti, the queen of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, the beloved royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. Nefertiti and her husband were known for a religious revolution in which they worshipped solely the sun disk Aten as their one and only god. Oh, blasphemy! She reigned during what was arguably the wealthiest and most lavish period of, of ancient Egypt. Here's the weird part. We don't know where she is. Usually kings and queens are buried in very spiritual, very high ranked places like the royal tomb. Easy to find. But nope, no one can find her or even know what happened to her. In 2015, archaeologists thought with high resolution scans, voids that are behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb proposed maybe that she was there. Nope, no Nefertiti. In 2003, archaeologists thought through the hair DNA, Nefertiti's mummy may have been quote the younger lady. Nope. Turns out it was just Tutankhamun's mom. So what exactly happened to this famously revered queen? Who knows? Aliens, dude. When in doubt, always aliens. You know what I mean? Number six, King Tut's death. When archaeologists opened a sarcophagus in Egypt's Valley of the Kings for the first time in 1923, it was the discovery of a lifetime. The ancient Egyptian boy king, King Tutankhamun, the burial chamber of the 19 year old who ruled 3,300 years ago. But why did he die so young? DNA tests and CT scans show he suffered from malaria, a broken leg, and congenital deformities associated with inbreeding, common amongst royalty. Ouch. Because of his tomb's extremely small size, historians think King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by A, who succeeded him as a pharaoh. The tomb's chambers were packed to the brim with more than 5,000 artifacts, including furniture, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. A 24 pound solid gold mask was placed over him and he was laid in a series of containers, three golden coffins and a granite sarcophagus. His death still has scientists scratching their heads. Also, look up how many archeologists died months after the cursed tomb had been raided. Yeah, you don't want to know. Number five, breaks. Yeah, I've never broken anything and I don't plan to. It sounds like the worst thing. I see it on Reddit and I'm like, ooh. But living in ancient Egypt, you're gonna break a bone or dislocate something sometime. But back then, it's not like you can just head over to the emergency and get an x-ray or a cast and then get your buddies, a couple of pharaohs to sign it and get some crutches and be on your way. No, so how did they treat broken bones or dislocations back then? Well, we can look at one example from that Edwin Smith papyrus that I mentioned earlier, where there was a patient with two dislocated clavicles. Now the treatment here is described as follows. If thou examinest a man having a dislocation in his two collarbones, thou shalt find his two shoulders turned over and the heads of his two collarbones turned towards his face. Imagine reading this and you're like, okay, uh, I think we turn this this way. No, this way. Hang on. Thou shouldn't cause them to fall back so that they rest in their places. Thou shalt bind it with stiff rolls of linen and thou shalt treat it afterwards with grease and honey every day. Yeah, if you break something, don't put grease and honey on. Go to the doctor's. 
years. Hit that thumbs up. There we go. The more we know. Number four, dental surgery. Okay, so back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you can go to the dentist, get your teeth checked and cleaned, whatever, once a year, however you do it, I don't know. And the diet of the ancient Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, the cleanest. If I can say that, you wouldn't have a set of pearly whites every single day, that's for sure. And that's due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, well, in your mouth, is not gonna feel too good. That would cause tooth loss or troubles at an early age. Through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time, and they're a little interesting, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, and yeah. Buckle up. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. Now this mummy and his first molar, a bunch of surgically produced holes were there that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were performed back then in some way, shape, or form. I mean, in the form of a bunch of holes and it's disgusting, but they tried. And do remember as you're watching this entire video, all this was done without any anesthetic. So drilling holes, breaking bones, putting linen into your arms, you're gonna feel all of it. Number three, Anubis. Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification. Yeah, he, uh, he had an interesting hobby, this one. Anubis, historically, he oversaw the embalming process during mummification. A lot of steps involved in mummification, so the backup here, you know, the backseat driving, that is Anubis, I'm sure was appreciated. Ancient Egyptians were so sophisticated in the mummification process that they also had to get really good at another major, well, kind of creepy, surgery, and that is the postmortem dissection. That matters, that's a pretty important step. See, in order to mummify the body, they needed to remove any moisture from it. Now this process included the removal of brain tissue, which was done through a quite a gruesome hook tool and some steady hands, that's for sure. This was not a medical practice, however, it was more of a spiritual one, right? It wasn't done by doctors, and this is exactly why they were getting extra up close and personal with internal organs during this process. The medical information they gathered during this process was never used for medical or medical advancement, but rather for spiritual, like Anubis, this ancient wonder. He kept trophies from those that he embalmed. Like, you know, different parts from people, that kind of thing. Word spreads, you know, hey, Nubis likes body parts, pass it on, this guy's weird. So in turn, for centuries now, Egyptians would then offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. They're like, you know what, hey, heard you like toes, big guy. Here you go, enjoy, put that in your jar. You love it. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. That was a great call. He loves that one, big fan. Number two, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path, okay? Just like ancient Rome, there's always a jealous brother or a jealous someone watching from the bushes, okay? Osiris's brother, Set, he was a jealous one. So he tried to take out Osiris at every single turn. Now, what elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked? This was like a saw trap set up. This is insane. So first, Set designed a coffin that fit Osiris's measurements, like to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying, challenging, that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin is his. Yeah, like a gift. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge. He jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, bam, Set locked him inside and threw the coffin in the Nile River. So in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. Yeah, gotcha, got the last one there. So if any of your coworkers wanna show you a coffin in the break room, respectfully decline the offer. It's, uh, it's probably a trap. And finally, number one, scarab worship. Yeah, we're getting stinky for the last one. Ancient Egyptians, they worshiped scarabs. They worshiped dung beetles. Now, when we think about animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles the whole time. They're OG, those little stinkers. Egyptians could not keep their hands or their minds off of dung beetles. The Egyptians would observe scarabs rolling these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle would disappear just like that into a hole in the sand. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun. Sun, which of course would go over and then leave at the end of the day. Just the ball rolling and then disappears. I can see the connections. Now the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab as a head. So he was responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every single day. And no, the sun wasn't a big ball of poop. It was just a big ball of life. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Dendera light. Here we go. Going back to ancient aliens, maybe, who knows. The Dendera light is a controversial image found in the temple of Hathor in Dendera, Egypt. Now some theories suggest that this this image here depicts an ancient Egyptian light bulb or some advanced electrical technology of some sorts, which is pretty exciting. However, mainstream Egyptologists interpret it as a symbolic representation of religious concepts. That makes more sense than ancient Egyptian light brights, I guess. I guess it's not as fun, but 
Sure, checks out. The bulb is more likely a depiction of the lotus flower, and the central figure holding a snake is associated with the creation myths. So, yeah, there's some history there. There's some tea behind. There's some stuff you have to know. The Dendera light is a subject of debate and speculation to this day, of course, because people want to believe that this is aliens, an alien light show. But there's currently no concrete evidence to support the claim that this represents ancient Egyptian knowledge of electricity or advanced lighting technology of sorts. Again, part of me wants to believe in ancient light bulbs, but maybe I've been playing too much Zelda. That's probably it. That's probably that, maybe. I don't know. Number nine, beer. Yeah, that's some pretty good stuff coming up next. Ancient Egyptians, they brewed and consumed beer on a daily basis. Now, they considered it a staple of their diet. Cool, me too, I guess. Beer production was primarily a household activity with everybody in the family helping the process, which is great. That's, what does your family taste like? Let's do it. The brewing techniques here involved fermenting grains, barley, and flavoring the beer with dates, honey, and spices, and pretty much anything you wanted. It's your brew. Get creative, throw, throw random shit in there. See how it tastes. Why not? It's ancient Egypt. Beer had both religious and social significance. Beer would be offered to deities and consumed during festivals and gatherings. Give a, a deity a Coors Light. You're like, here you go. This ought to cool you down. Rocky Mountain certified, buddy. Stop yelling, stop cursing our lands. It also provided hydration, nutrition, and a means of socializing in ancient Egyptian society. So hard to say no to that. Twist my arm, please. Number eight, curses. Of course, these are, these are real. These are very real. And you'll get cursed if you don't hit that thumbs up. Ancient Egyptian curses are a subject of fascination and speculation, of course. Curses were believed to be supernatural powers wielded by priests or individuals to protect sacred sites and or tombs from desecration. These curses often warned of dire consequences for anyone who disturbed the resting place of a pharaoh or violated these sacred spaces at all. The curses were typically inscribed on tomb walls or objects and invoked the wrath of gods and spirits. Ergo, don't touch my sh Thanks. Many inscriptions contain symbolic threats rather than the direct supernatural actions. So the curse of the pharaohs is mainly associated with King Tut. This curse gained attention when several individuals involved in the excavation of Tut's tomb just died unexpectedly. However, these deaths can be attributed to natural causes or coincidences, of course. But the timing here was a little, it's a little cursed. Nobody really knows, right? We wanna believe. Maybe it's fun to believe. That way we won't steal things from the dead, right? Let's go that way. Number seven, a pet hippo. Are you a dog person? Are you a cat person? How about hippos? They're fun. They'll maybe eat you, who knows? Real quick, do you have any idea how fast hippos are? I had no clue my entire life. I thought they were fat and fun and stationary. No, hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Their bite is three times as powerful as the bite of a lion's. Yeah, so you shouldn't fuck with them. You shouldn't fuck with them with a pH. <laughs> the Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh. We refer to him as the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, don't know much about him, but also he was killed by his pet hippo, therefore definitely lost. We lost him fast, fast and loud. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and after all of that, all the wars and conquests and all the treaties, after all that, a hippo got him. What a shame. I mean, to be fair, I don't think there's a harder way to go out as a king. A hippo kills you? I don't know. That's pretty badass. That's like top three coolest ways to die next to like the Megalodon. I don't know. Number six, Israel Sphinx Claws. Ah, here we go. Some ancient Wolverine stuff coming in here. The mystery of the Sphinx Claws in Israel. This refers to a set of large limestone claws that were of course discovered near the city of Tel Hazor. Now these claws resemble feline paws of some sort. They're very sharp, very large, very intimidating, and they're believed to have once been part of a Sphinx sculpture. So if someone just took a little bit home with them, that's always nice. The origin and purpose of these claws of course remain uncertain. Now, some theories suggest that they were brought from Egypt or represent the influence of Egyptian culture in the region. One of the two. Someone stole it or someone was inspired. One of the two. Others propose alternative explanations such as symbolic or decorative elements. However, without further evidence or historical context, we don't really know because this was, I don't know, 3,000 years ago. Where did these hands come from? They're scary, but we'll never know. It is fascinating. I just wanted to show you these cool hands. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, Aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genital 
Ilya the Pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers. But the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in sea Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number 4 is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crown, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard! He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serf strip naked, cover themselves in honey and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number 3 is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a kleptomaniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he had been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number 2 is cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actus Sains, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actus Sains fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Acta Sains was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one, it is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Acted everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they're working and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national socionomic and cultural hubs. It was the gods priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest 
recession and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson tree. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archaeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it, a worshipped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles, again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin, but in doing so, they got a little bit too excited, they didn't really know what they were doing back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else there's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot, really. Let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact. That's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three rows of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, that'd be so anxious. That'd be so nerve-wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. 
That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in, historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue really at this point was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ocarina enough time. I always check the pots. The name Paten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use his name historically was the long lost queen of Akhenaten. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Poof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh. Let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. Disturbing decision number five is the piss fetish. Sarasostris, the cubic pillar guy, had a son named Pharos who had gone blind at a young age. Now this was likely some kind of disease or family genetic or maybe even the result of an infection or the result of pissing off the god. See, the legend says Pharos was fed up with the Nile flooding and it refusing to listen to his decree to stop flooding. It's a fucking river. What are you thinking? So the dummy tossed a spear at it in frustration I don't know, rampant stupidity maybe, assuming that would work, and for said stupidity and insolence, he was allegedly struck blind by the gods. Ten years go by, and an oracle happens to roll through Egypt with a message for the blind pharaoh that he could get his sight back. All he had to do, she told him, was wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who had never slept with anyone other than her husband. Off pharaohs went, no questions asked, such as what temperature it needed to be. If dark yellow or clear is better, you know, the fixins. He immediately finds his wife. Life and either hands her a bucket or takes a knee because somehow that piss got in the man's eyes as the prophet requested. Yet nothing happened. Ferris was still blind and now his wife has some explaining to do. First though, Ferris was very focused on not being blind so he had the army round up every married woman in town. Everyone's given a bucket or like said, the king took a knee. History does not preserve the piss to eyes transportation method. Finally, after being peed on by an undisclosed amount of women, Ferris saw the light thanks to the one woman in all of Egypt who hadn't cheated on on her husband, which Pharaohs immediately changed by having her divorce her husband and become his new wife on the spot. Then together, they burnt his last wife at the stake and lived happily ever after. Disturbing decision number four is Hepsed. Back in ancient Egypt, things weren't quite so simple because apparently a pharaoh who had ruled for 30 years also needed to perform a minor Olympics by themselves. Egyptians observed a strange ritual called Hepsed, which culminated in the pharaoh running around a racetrack in the courtyard of their palace wearing a kilt with an animal's tail attached to it and woe betide anyone who didn't complete the course. It became one of the oldest and longest running rituals of Egyptian history, having existed for 5,000 years. It usually took place on the fourth month of the Egyptian calendar, so it coincided with the Nile flooding. The pharaoh would make numerous offerings to the gods and having a lavish recrowning ceremony. Some occasions concluded with the pharaoh being given a ceremonial bow and arrow he'd shoot towards the four corners of the kingdom just to show how far reaching their power was. Once a pharaoh had celebrated their first hepset, they had to repeat the ceremony every three years until their death. The main event had the pharaoh, as said, dressed in a short kilt with the tail of a bull or some similar creature attached to the back and placed on a running track in front of an audience of dignitaries where they'd be made to run as quickly as possible around the track. Besides simply giving the pharaoh a chance to demonstrate their vigor and athleticism, Egyptologists are unclear precisely what the point of the pharaoh's bizarre foot race really was. Some have suggested it was purely ceremonial and represented the pharaoh out running old age. Others claim that it was intended like the bow and arrow to represent the pharaoh reaching all parts of their kingdom. Others have claimed that there was much more practical 
reason for it. If the pharaoh wasn't able to complete the course, then they were no longer fit to rule, and they would be promptly sacrificed to make way for their younger, fitter successor. Disturbing decision number three is to let the priests punish. There was a time period where the power of the pharaohs slipped away into the hands of the priests, who puppeteered young and inexperienced throne heirs into dumb decisions and handing over too much power. Priests' influence and power over the common people increased continually over the years, and before long they were being consulted for far more than they had ever been before. Those in power knew better than to question the priests too much, as they were considered able to contact and gain support of the gods. Thus, it would be like questioning the gods, which as you know from point one is a big ol' no-no. This power would also be able to potentially influence large amounts of people to do their bidding. So naturally, in the latter days of ancient Egypt, the priesthood now found itself involved in matters of court. They would bring in a statue of the sun god and set papyri before it with different options for important decisions. In court, they were genuinely two papers deciding innocent or guilt. The statue was supposed to turn towards whichever the correct paper was showing the will of the gods. Of course, this gave the priests a chance to manipulate the statue's movements and essentially decide the court cases based on their own opinions, biases, and whims. Disturbing decision number two is river seedlings, aka how the pharaoh would whip it out in front of the entire kingdom once a year and yank his proverbial chain until completion into the Nile. This came from the story of how Ra created the earth through the act of sacred self-pleasure, something that the Egyptians glorified and saw as an act connecting oneself with the gods, their own spiritual essence, and their physical being. And they're not wrong, it's an incredibly healthy approach to viewing self-pleasure. The ancient world, especially ancient Egypt, was obsessed with growth, birth, creation, and that which gave life, with many myths and legends springing up in and around the concept of fertility. The Nile was also revered for life-giving qualities, so it should come as no surprise that the ceremonial spilling of seed during an annual festival devoted to it, Ra and the life, would occur. The symbolism here is pretty powerful when we consider the fact that the ancients viewed time in a circular format, rather than a linear succession of moments. In fact, the ancient Egyptian word for seed, progeny, and describing the floods of the Nile was all the same word, MTWT. No idea how to pronounce it, not gonna try. The ancient Egyptians knew life-giving, fertilizing ways of the predictable floods of the Nile, and they saw the same properties in seed. So after your pharaoh had finished his duty by the Nile, the noblemen would take their turn as a group, followed by all the men of Egypt being invited to spill their seed in the river of life as well. Call it community bonding. Disturbing decision number one is the daughter deal. Khufu, the son of Snefru, decided to one-up his old man when he commissioned the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world. Even though there's still much left to speculation, there's a few things we do know for certain about the Great Pyramid, such as the fact they are oversized tombs dedicated to the pharaoh's ego. They were originally covered in white limestone, and gold. They were never used for grain storage. It took Khufu about 20 years to have his build, and he sold his daughter as a pleasure worker in the process. Let's uh, let's pause on that last one real quick. Yeah, so Khufu didn't really have the funds to spend on a pyramid of this size and grandeur, but he was determined to beat out his daddy. Herodotus, the OG history recorder of Egypt, makes more than one mention of it, and usually with a lot of attitude because even he thought it was a little rank and Herodotus had seen some shit. To quote, Khufu descended to such a degree of infamy that he sold his own daughter in a brothel and ordered her to exact, they do not say how much, but she exacted a certain amount of money as much as her father had ordered her to. Like in ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt at least saw being a working girl as a divine and respectable act done for the gods. So it wasn't like everyone in the kingdom, including Khufu, went on to destroy this poor girl's life. Rather deemed what she did an honorable and godly service. But still, pretty effed up that her dad would blow all his money on a project to the point he asked his own daughter to hit the streets. You're the pharaoh, this is your project, and this is free love ancient Egypt, baby. So why don't you go get your own bag? Number 10, Snake Eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's no calzone, red flag. But yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful for some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung, and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. 
Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. It seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients. Applicable powder and bugs. Yeah. You know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you could find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Place that glazed servant away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot, that one. You don't wanna be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Could put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go. But in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000-year-old tomb from the 11th dynasty, tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. And officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. 
Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the City of the Dead, Sakara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher, who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort gone into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers next will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found. So when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes I is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian. And it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him, so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes' brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia, as well as in Egypt, people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to pay 
ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually, the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much, and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and, by extension, the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number nine is a famous hussy, Ramses II. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure, 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 sure. He was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind and made Egypt prosperous, blah, blah. He's the son of Seti I, and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But Homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying, two faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had banging, enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the Great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him, and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number eight is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number seven is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It's said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number six is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had six years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Number five, let's reuse, reduce, and recycle our rotten food. More questionable cure-alls. As I mentioned in point number eight, moldy bread was used by doctors for medical reasons such as medicine or gauzing techniques. This is because Egyptians, from what we can gather, seem to have figured out the antibiotic properties and believed the exposure of mold to a wound would better aid in the immune system for next time, if not at least help the quicker healing process this time. But Egyptians also reused other rotten foods. For example, sour milk was also used medicinally, believed bathing in it would help with skin disease or dryness. I mean, all that sand is bound to have a little bit of a chafy effect. Honey, which also happens to be a natural bacteria killer 
trailer may not have been rotten, but it was put on open wounds similar to how we use polysporin today. And while rotten donkey liver may not have been medicine, the Egyptians were quick to slather it on their head and get a nice even dye job. Number 4 in our countdown is a different kind of rotten, the casual neck the Egyptians were known for their fascination with life, death, and sex. In their beliefs, the god Ra actually created the universe and the first two gods through mass. Osiris, another god who eventually came along, became father to Horus posthumously after Isis had with his dead body. Ra also had with Osiris posthumously, but it seems his use of onion juice worked pretty well and he didn't father any children with the dead body. Now just because it's in their godly pantheon doesn't mean just anyone was necrophilic in ancient Egypt, but those who were may have had that lust arguably feeling a little more justified in their pursuit of rotten ladies. So there was an issue with necrophilia towards the deceased bodies of Egyptian women, to the extent that their loved ones began a habit of letting their corpses sit out for 2-3 days before passing them to the embalmers so as to dissuade sex. The logic was is that the embalmers wouldn't want to have sex with the body that was already beginning to rot. I mean they shouldn't want to have sex with the body in the first place, but I guess beggars can't be choosers. Regardless, neck embalmers were apparently common enough for the Grecian writer Herodotus, who famously documented a lot of cultures practices to make special note of. Let's take a break from the funky stuff to talk about a different kind of pussy. Number 3, the obsession with cats. Guys, I am super biased to this one. Don't know if you can notice the fine sheen of cat hair I rep, but I'm with the ancient Egyptians on the cat praise. Ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshipped them. Believed to be gatekeepers of the underworld, these little beasts were spiritual and metaphorical symbols for Egyptians, and they were even believed to be gods themselves. The act of harming, eating, or killing a cat warranted a death penalty as a result. And while adoring your family pet isn't bizarre, the effects of worshipping something are. When the family cat died, every member in the household would shave off their eyebrows to mourn its death. And if a building was burning, people would save the cats before they even put out the fire. Being the first society to domesticate cats, Egyptians used cats for extermination aside from the companionship, which worked so well that their agricultural society dominated that of the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. Of course, there were cons to this obsession. For example, when the Persian invaders showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptian army retreated in fear of killing a cat, allowing the invaders to their soldiers and the pharaoh and take over rule of Egypt. Oops. Unlike other animals, cats were often mummified and buried in tombs dedicated to the goddess Bastet. Recovered cat figurines made of wood, stone, and bronze can be found in museums and collections all across the world. Number two is a modern day medical emergency, but to ancient Egyptians, it was just his time of the month. While it's astounding that medical accomplishments that Egyptians had made, specialized doctors, antibiotics, even surgery, you can see from their contraceptives in point 6, Egyptians didn't always nail it. In fact, the disease Shitso Matsasia, we'll just call it by its second name, Bilharzia, was so common that they didn't even realize it was a disease, and it infected nearly everyone. How did it slip under the radar though? The side effects of the disease make people feel sick, and it caused blood in their urine and fecal matter. Seeing as menstruation also came with bloody urine and feeling sick, Egyptians simply thought they were menstruating, and came to accept that men had to do the same as women. Blood and urine became a normal part of growing up for boys, and Egyptian society was already very big on gender nonconformity, even having records of sex changes, so this really was an outlandish thinking to them. In reality, Bilharzia was actually parasitic worms having a field day in their junk. Irregardless, a man peeing blood was even treated as a sign of his fertility. No better sign a man was ready to father a family than being infected with parasites. Man, what a trip this countdown has been. You may be wondering what can take the cake. It's the ceremonial circle in at number 1. So as prior mentioned, ancient Egyptians believed Ra to have created much of life and existence through, well, his masturbatory sessions. This was also believed about the Nile River, Egypt's famous river that flows 6600 kilometers before it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These ancient Egyptians believed that the flow of the river represented the frequency of Ra's ejection. Seeing as the Nile was the source of Egyptian agriculture, it was incredibly important that that flow remains. Well, it's 4000 BC, and everyday people don't exactly see their gods wandering around. So, with their pharaoh being the personification of God, the duty fell onto him. So, once a year, in the last month of summer, during the festival Min that celebrated the pharaoh's rule, the pharaoh would approach the Nile, remove his robe, and master over the Nile River in a sacred public ceremony. He had a large retinue of men that would also 
into the river at the same time as him. Once the pharaoh and his men had well finished, any man was welcome to unload in the river too. It was believed that these cultural and religious practices would ensure that the Nile would continue to flow for the next year to come. All right, so the Cambyses are up first. Cambius was the son of Cyrus the first and the succeeder of his father in Anshan as the king of Agistius of Media. According to the fifth century BC Greek historian Herodotus, Cambius married a daughter of Asidius, by whom he became the father of Cyrus the second. Cambius the second, aka Cyrus the second, performed the ritual duties of the Babylonian king at the important New Year festival of 538 and of 530. Before Cyrus set out on his last campaign, he was appointed the regent in Babylon. That campaign was the conquest of Egypt, planned by Cyrus, and was a major achievement of Cambius's reign once captured. This is the lunatic who liked to torture animals for entertainment and notoriously killed the Apis bull to torment the Greeks who worshipped it. Cambius was traveling through Syria on his way back to Persia when he first heard reports of a revolt there. And then he died mysteriously in Syria in the summer of 522, either by his own hand or as the result of an accident. This is one of the few Persian families to have held the throne, the Xerxes line. First we have the granddaddy Xerxes I, or the Great as titled by the fifth Persian king. He was the son of Darius the Great and his reign lasted from 486 BC to 465 BC. He's well known in history for his attempted invasion of Greece and how later in the same year he was defeated in the Battle of Salamis which led him to flee his own kingdom. He's known as both a Persian ruler and a pharaoh as when he ruled Egypt it was also part of the Persian Empire. Little is known about the last years of Xerxes life. After his reversal in Greece he withdrew into himself and allowed himself to be drawn into his harem intrigues in which he was in fact only a pawn. Thus he disposed of his brother's entire family at the demand of the queen. He was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard forces. Another son, Artaxerxes the first, succeeded in retaining power. Artaxerxes the first was given the throne by the commander of the guard, Artabanus, who had killed Xerxes. It's fine though, cause Xerxes Jr. got his daddy's lick back when he kills Arta about a month later. His reign, though generally peaceful, was disturbed by several insurrections, the first of which was the revolt of his brother. During his reign, Artaxerxes completed the Hall of 100 Columns at Persepolis, rebuilt the palace of Darius I at Susa after a fire, and Artaxerxes died of natural causes in 424 BCE, having ensured a peaceful succession by naming Xerxes II his legitimate heir. Xerxes II reigned for only a little over a month, however, before he was assassinated. Next is the Dossier line. Starting with Dossi Dossier from the Second Kingdom Egypt's Third Dynasty, he undertook the construction of the earliest important stone buildings in Egypt. His reign, which probably lasted 19 years, was marked by great technological innovation in the use of stone architecture. The innovative structure was a departure from the traditional use of mud bricks alongside stone. The greatest advance, however, was the completion of alteration of the shape of a monument from a flat-topped rectangular structure known as a mastaba to a six-stepped pyramid. This great character built the famous pyramid and set up the construction mechanisms of large buildings, paving the way for successors of their kingdom for even more daring constructions. The Pyramid of Dossier is the first pyramid in history of ancient Egypt and therefore potentially all of humanity. It is a degree pyramid that is at the center of a funerary complex of great importance. It's located in the necropolis of Saqqara. Sekhemet is probably the brother or eldest son of King Dossier. Little is known about this king since he ruled for only a few years. However, he erected a step pyramid at Saqqara and left behind a well-known rock inscription at the Wadi Makara. No pep in his servant steps for sure, it's Pepe. So Pepe the first kills the game. He does a great job ruling Egypt. He initiated the policy of, of intensive penetration of Nubia south of the first Nile cataract. Inscriptions record journeys southward early in his reign and fragments of vessels bearing the king's name were excavated in Karma. Meanwhile, Pepe the second is the longest running Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. He's also believed to be the youngest ruler ever in Egyptian history. Pepe the second was the son of Pepe the first, obviously, and was born late into his father's reign. While he was still very young, he succeeded his half-brother Marine, who died at an early age. His mother served as regent for a number of years, and the old group of officials serving the royal family maintained the kingdom's stability. During the first half of his rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half? 
nowhere close. You see a sharp decline of the old kingdom as economic disarray is caused by him virtually having no oversight. Powerful provincial nobles drew talent away from the capital and because of the unusually long reign of the king, Egypt had a senile ruler when it needed vigorous leadership. Those of Pepe's children who survived him had brief ephemeral reigns and failed to cope with the political and economic crisis that arose as the sixth dynasty ended. His tomb may be more famous than he is, Menkures. His tomb, the Pyramid of Menkure, is one of three pyramids of Giza alongside his statue triads that show the king together with his wives and various deities. It's the smallest of the three main pyramids of Giza, just 62 meters tall, but has one of the most complex and best preserved structures. He had two wives, both are his sisters naturally, and they didn't have much luck with sons at first. Three in total and one daughter. At his death, his successor, his son, Shafaskek, completed the stonework walls of the mortuary temple in brick. Menaku was not succeeded by his eldest son, who actually predeceased him, but rather by Shepsake, a younger son. Shepsake built a monumental mastaba at the South Accra and was the only kingdom ruler to not build a pyramid. This family's work, especially the Great Pyramids, show a great mastery of monumental stoneworking. Individual blocks were larger, colossal, and were extremely accurately fitted. Titi's disappearance. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced. This family forced fun. She worshipped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female Pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. There's like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII. The last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is. What exactly happened? When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here? He was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KV-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QV43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two. Baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. 
The other animals are fun, like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, you know, anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collections of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC to 10 BC. Yeah. He's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away, and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research, and you finally find this door, this ancient door, you find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long. We did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west. That's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go. Kicking off our list at number 10, afterlife servant. Ancient Egyptians were closely connected to the afterlife, or at least they tried to be. After a loved one passed, ancient Egyptians would ensure that they have everything that they needed in the living world as well in the afterlife, right? Every valuable belonging, everything that you held dear to you your entire life, ideally, that's what you want to take to the other side, right? And that also included, sadly, lifelong servants. These masters were thinking about their necessities in the afterlife, and of course, being otherwise useless without their servant, they have to bring them too. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? That would probably suck for the other guy, right? Yeah, it did. It really did. Someone dies, now you gotta go too? You're like, what? Forced to be a literal ride or die. That is impossibly unfair. That's ancient Egypt for you. This tradition thankfully changed before many of these famous pharaohs that we know were put into power. So it didn't last forever, this horrible theme, this idea, but it did happen a lot. Famous pharaohs came into power, and this tradition underwent a change but eventually this practice led to the introduction of number nine. The Shabti. The Shabti were tiny carved figurines that would often be placed inside of these tombs of the pharaohs. Now you've probably seen them at some point and thought that they were just a valued belonging, which obviously they were, but their real purpose was much more grand. These beautiful little works of art were always shaped like mummies and on each and every Shabti carved into them were special instructions that determined what job they got in the afterlife. Yeah, it's like the world's oldest resume right there. Number eight, what's the buzz? Here we go, shout out to all the bees. Cleopatra was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and she had some bold ideas, you could say. So we're not exactly sure of its purpose, but we have some ideas, but there's a large amount of experts that have all agreed that Cleopatra, Greek Egyptian ruler of Egypt, she was known to sometimes fill a small box with a bunch of bees, and then shake that box around to disturb said bees, and voila, now we have a very weak massager. There's been some speculation as to why she created this bee box, and sure, you can use your imagination to some degree, probably, yes. This invention this scandalous idea, we're pretty sure it was inspired during her time ruling in Egypt, because, you know, all the bees. Also, to put a box of bees anywhere near your box of bees, you know what I mean? Bravo, that's brave. If she did what all these scholars think that she did with this vibrating box of bees, then double bravo. That's brave. I don't even go near one bee flying around, let alone a box of them. No, thank you. Number seven, shaved eyebrows. <gasps> Oh, close one. I thought they were gone there for a second. Look, I love animals, okay? We all grew up with cats, dogs in our family, birds. We had a chameleon at one point. That was interesting. But nobody mourned for their furry loved ones like ancient Egyptians. When the family cat died back then, not one, but every family member involved in the household, they would all shave off their eyebrows to mourn the cat's death. Cats were loved extra hard back then. Yeah, you think cats are spoiled today? When's the last time you saw your friend with their shaved eyebrows after their cat passed away? Yeah, didn't think so. God forbid, but if that fateful day shall arrive, commit. You know what I mean? Shave them off. Show them your love and shave them off. Number six, stitches. While surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, common surgeries, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, one, no painkillers and antibiotics, and two, it's gonna hurt and the list goes on and on. It's horrible. But one thing that's less invasive but still quite extremely important back then that was seen quite a bit during these times was the use of stitches. Yeah, 
probably need some at some point. Building pyramids made of stones and rocks, you're gonna cut yourself. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own stitches in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers, hair, so gross, tendons, even more gross, and even wool threads. Evidence in different mummified remains have been discovered. Yeah, imagine that, you cut your arm, you have to use someone else's tendon to stitch it up. No thanks, just leave it open, I'm all set. In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, that came to ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described, and they all sound like a great time. One example from the text of treating a laceration reads, quote, if thou findest that wound open and it's stitching loose, Thou shalt draw together for him the gash with two strips of linen. Basically says, hey, if you cut yourself, grab a shirt. Good luck. Don't move too quick. Number five. What? Well, I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about. I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really. It's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly, it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be, at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that? And you're just like, oh, what? It, it walked up that out of my mouth. That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which, in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, curse craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung, and people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes, and to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. Oh God, that's, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, 
Then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake. Ooh.